everyone, and welcome to the Able Voices Podcast. I'm Dr. Rhoda Bernard, Founding Managing Director of the Berkeley Institute for Arts Education and Special Needs, and I am proud to present this podcast featuring disabled artists and arts educators. We are inviting artists with disabilities to be guest hosts for the Able Voices Podcast. The guest host for today's episode is internationally celebrated mezzo-soprano Sophia Grech. Hailed by the Sunday Times as a singer who delivers without effort, Sophia has won great acclaim and notoriety for her performances at leading concert halls, opera houses, and international festivals worldwide, leading to regular invitations to give master classes around the world. In 2015, Sophia was diagnosed with autism, and she is now a leading ambassador on behalf of autism organizations. Her book, titled I Wish I Could Sing, was published in 2020. I hope you enjoy this episode, hosted by Sophia Grech. It's a pleasure to be hosting today's Able Voices podcast, and joining me for this episode is the renowned British actor Mark Beer. Mark, who was born with cerebral palsy, has enjoyed a busy career spanning over 30 years on both the stage and screen. At the age of 17, Mark won the bronze medal at the Cheltenham Literary Festival, and in 2017, he was nominated by BBC Radio Drama for the Norman Beaton Fellowship Award. Welcome, Mark. We're delighted that you could join us today for this Able Voices podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to start off by asking you to tell us your story as an actor. How did you start your career as an actor and how did you get where you are today? <laughs> I'll try and do that as, as simply as possible. Um, <laughs> I started working professionally when I was 17. Um, but before that, at the age of 16, I auditioned for all the top drama schools in the country. Um, I'd RADA, Lambda, Central, all of the main ones. And this is going back to 1983. Um, and of course they were not accessible back then. And so two out of the three top drama schools took me aside and said, Mark, I'm really sorry we can't um, offer you a place because we're not accessible. So I said, fine, what do you suggest I should do? And they said, we suggest that you go to work as soon as possible. And luckily I was in college in Cheltenham for people with disabilities and took part in the Cheltenham Literary Festival and a director spotted me there and offered me a job. And within a couple of weeks, I was playing the lead in a play called Chairperson at Riverside Studios in Hammersmith. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Um, can I ask what inspired you to become an actor? I think the, the, there's a lot of theatricality in the family. My, my mommy's brother's sister, I'm sorry, my mummy's brother's daughter, my cousin, in other words, um, was a dancer, a trained dancer, and tread the boards. And so there was a possibility when I was very young I kept thinking as a child, because no one really explained my disability to me when I was very young, until I was old enough to understand it. So I just automatically assumed that one day I'd be able to stand up and go off to ballet school like she did. And once I realized at the age of about 15, when my uncle, her father spoke to me and said, actually, this is not going to happen and you're going to be like this for the rest of your life. Um, so I decided, having spent two days in my bedroom crying about it, I then decided, right, okay, now I need to do something else. And the obvious choice was to act instead of dance. That's amazing. So did you excel at drama at school? I did really, because I loved it so much. I mean, at the age of 14 or 15, I can't remember which, I played Macbeth and um, that really started me with the bug really. Oh, amazing. So was there an actor that really inspired you when you were growing up? There wasn't a disabled one, i.e. until I started working and I met Nabil Shaban, who founded Grey Eye Theatre Company, the only national wow. theatre company of Great Britain. Um, wow. and, and I've since worked with Nabil on stage and on screen. So it's really lovely how he inspired me from a young age because he was the only person that I could draw from. And obviously both physically and 
um, and and artistically we're very different people but we have actually worked together many times now that's absolutely amazing and did your parents really support your choice to become an actor obviously it was in the family um <laughs> i'd like to say yes but the honest <laughs> the honest answer is no um oh. my, <laughs> my whole family have a chain of um jewelry shops in oh. Bir- in birmingham and stratford on avon and oh. Um, it went back three, four generations. So it was automatically assumed that I would become a secretary and answer the telephones and, <laughs> you know, do, do what was required of me, really. But my, mo- my mommy was very, very, very supportive and still is to this day. Oh, and that's lovely. Very lovely. And um, we have a great relationship. And she, instead of enrolling me at, at secretarial college, found this college in Cheltenham where I went to study drama for two years. Oh that's fantastic and I also wanted to ask one of your first jobs I think it was presenting on BBC television um, I'm sure that I remember seeing you on a on, on a program when I was a child. <laughs> that's very lovely I used to present a children's program called Play Days which was that's it preschool children that's and I it. did I did that from the age of 22 to 27. So, wow. What was it like being a presenter? I really loved it and naturally enjoyed it and naturally connected with the children. And I think uh, it helped enormously that I had no fear about it. Because when you're young, you have no fear. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I just, I, I was in a production of Beowulf touring the country and the director of the... Uh, from the BBC, Brian Jemison, who subsequently has produced things like Balamori over mm. here. Um, and he saw me, came to see me in the show, and then had a, I had a lunch meeting with him afterwards, and he offered me the job on the spot. Oh, that's absolutely amazing. Wow. It was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Which, which was very, very lovely. And I was there. Yeah on and off over five years, really. Absolutely brilliant. Now, I really wanted to ask you, could you tell us about your experiences as a person living with a disability? And if this has obviously impacted on your career and basically what challenges you've had to overcome? That's a big question. I'll try my best. I know. (laughs) Yes, obviously it has impacted enormously on my, on Mm. my choices. And in my early career, I think, I can remember my agent who looked after me from 17 to 27, um, constantly being told by casting directors that uh, it was a great shame because I had a great face and I had great ability, but because of my disability, um, it was very hard for them to cast me. And I remember some big BBC drama series, um, I forget what it was called at, at the time, but they actually connected with my agent and, and really wanted me to read for this lead role. And then once they realized I was actually disabled because they'd just seen my face and stuff on Spotlight, they obviously dropped the idea really. Mm. So in the early days, it was very much about proving that I could act and, see, and proving to see beyond my disability. And I'd like to say that that's changed, but not really. Not really. That's a shame. Um, it also, can I just ask, you have to do a lot of pre-planning for travelling? Because I imagine travelling can be a challenge. I joined a new agent today, um, this year, who is right. a lovely, lovely lady called Nicola Bolton. And she has, since joining her in January, put me up for a number of tours. And I toured basically non-stop from 17 to 42. Wow. <laughs> as I'm 55 this year. And, and um, I said to her, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not prepared to tour anymore. Because, partly because of the traveling, but partly because physically, I don't have um, the same strength as I used to have, you know mm. what I mean? And the same stamina. Mm. You don't, when I started at 17, I was a boy, <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? So yes, yes. The, and obviously, although, the production companies have been very kind and said, oh, they'll make it as easy as possible and blah, blah, blah. I consciously made a decision 
in my mid forties, actually, I will go and work anywhere, anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country, anywhere, as long as I'm based in one place. I just don't want to do a week here and a week there and a week here and a week there anymore. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And do you find that your colleagues and um, other cast members are helpful and considerate of your disability? I have to say, I think in the whole, what, 38 years this year, I've only had two companies that have not. And I won't name them because they're not worth naming. But Mm. um, in that whole time, that's that's remarkable, really. And, you know, I would say 99.9% have been very supportive and very lovely. Well, that's brilliant. Now, I understand that you have an excerpt from one of your performances, which you'd like to share with us. Could you please tell us about what we're going to hear? I think you've got two pieces, but one of them uh, was taken from Talking Heads by Alan yes. Bennett. Yes, that's yeah. it. The Talking Heads by Alan Bennett, which I recorded um, in 2020. And I'm playing Graham Whitaker, the role that he wrote for himself, basically. They go mad round the war memorial. So when we cross over, I generally slip my arm through hers till we're safely across. Only once we're on the pavement, she postpones from letting go. Because once upon a time, we were stopped by one of those questionnaire women who reckons to take us for husband and wife. I mean, mam's got white hair. She was doing this bit of a dodge and I said, Mam, let go of my arm. And the next thing, I didn't really wrench it, but the next thing I know, she was flat on the pavement. And I said, oh my God, mother. People gathered round and I picked up a bag. And she sits up and says, oh, I've loaded both my stockings. I said, never mind your stockings. What about your pelvis? She said, it's these bifocals. They tell you not to look down. I was avoiding some sick. And then somebody says, that's a familiar voice. This little fella bending over her, green trilby hat, shorty raincoat. Hello, he says, remember me? Oh, well, thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. Um, Now I can hear that you have an accent in this. Um, I believe, is it a Northern accent? (laughs) It's my attempt to have a Northern accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I have to say, my friends that come from the north of England are very happy with it. So I was pleased, yeah. But it's definitely not my... This is my normal accent, what I'm speaking now. So, yes. uh, what's, what's your favourite accent to do? Do you um, have a favourite accent? I would say I really enjoy trying to do a Cockney, which is quite difficult. Oh. <laughs> um because I've been based in London for over 35 years now. And I've been to the casting directors of EastEnders twice. Mm. And both times, obviously, for accent reasons, I think, um, they've cast me as middle-class posh men. So, oh. so um, I don't think I'm going to be cast as a Cockney <laughs> anytime soon, really. Um, how easy is it to learn an accent as an actor? Um, it really depends on how the speech is written. If the speech is written properly and has the right rhythm to it, like a piece of Shakespeare or a, or a lovely piece of poetry, it's very easy because it's written oh. in, in a way that your voice can follow. Um, oh. And if it's not, if it's very badly written, then it's very hard. Oh, well, that kind of makes sense, actually. And also, I know that our listeners would like to hear about any drama training that you did receive and how you learnt scripts and do you learn in the same way today or is it different? No, I mean, I I was very lucky. I did go to the City Literature Literature Institute in Hoban, just around the corner from the West End. Um, I had a beautiful friendship and a lovely lady in my life called Catherine Schofield, who was a... um, very famous actress in the 60s, 70s and 80s in England. She has done a lot of American movies also. And um, Katie passed away some years ago. But when we were very close, uh, right up from the time I met her in early 2000, um, so she passed away. Um, 
uh, sorry, met her in late 80s, sorry, and she passed away in 2003. And she encouraged me to go to a professional acting class there at the City Lit. And her dear friend, Valerie Colgan, coached me for over 10 years, I think. And wow. that's how I used to go every Friday to this professional class that was um, funded by the government. And um, you paid them a, a small amount of money. And obviously, as I was working full time, I could easily afford that. And so I, I deliberately, um, unless I was filming or, you know, I went every Friday so that I could maintain my voice, really. And I, I definitely know that having had that weekly training for over 10 years has stood me in great, great stead. Well, that's absolutely amazing. Do, do, do you find that it's easy to learn scripts as you get older? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, would, uh, I would say it was much easier when I was younger. I think your memory is is sharper and things but I'm actually very dyslexic so everything I have oh. to, le to learn um I put onto audio tape you know oh. so I, I can listen to it like I'm listening to you, to you now yes. through my headphones yes. um and I have a number of friends that will help me or my partner will help me and read it backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and so right. But my ability to learn quickly hasn't left me. Right, and I, okay. I, I think that's because of doing live telly, you know, recorded live telly for five years or whatever it was. Scripts would change constantly on a daily basis, so you'd have to learn them very fast. Oh, okay, so which is easiest to learn, TV or stage productions? I think it's easier to learn um, the theatre, as in, you know, a stage production, because it never changes. So no. what, w once you know it, it's very unlikely that the director is going to turn up on stage after opening night and say, can you do it this way? Can you do it that way? Um, oh. well, whereas if you're recording in a studio, um, they can very much easily stop you and say, oh, we'd like it to be moved. We'd like it to change. We'd like to add this line. or We'd like to add this paragraph or whatever. Oh, isn't it uh, more frightening when it's live performance? Because, well, it's live. <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends, really. I mean, I personally enjoy it much more. I think it's because I've done main, much more theatre of late than I have telly. Um, because I did a lot of my telly kind of from, I'd say, 20 to 30. And then went back into theatre after that. Um, yeah. And so... My passion will always be live theatre, really. I mean, I, you know, I have no qualms. I will do telly, I will do film, I will do whatever I, I'm lucky enough to be cast in. But if I had a choice, I, I'd stay in working in the theatre, I think. Ah, OK. Can I also ask, um, what has your experience been of changes to accessibility for disabled actors during your career? There's been a massive change mm. in the sense that um, when I started, I had to be carried up and down stairs like a bag of potatoes mm. or put into the guards van in a, on a train journey because there were no accessible seats. Mm. I mean, huge, huge, huge changes in the sense that now there are probably about 10 or 15 accessible mainstream theatres in in the UK that were never accessible to begin with. And they've only really become accessible in the last 10 years or so. Right. Is that uh, older theatres that have got funding to make changes or are these new theatres? I think it's a little bit of both, really. I think a oh. lot of a lot of them, a lot of the original theatres have been given national lottery grants or grants from um, local authorities. And I mean, I'm, I got in touch with recently the Chelsea Theatre because it was recommended to me as a working space because it's brand new and it's got mm. all wheelchair accessibility in yes. place, which of course it would have to now because yes. the industry has changed so much and moved forward so much. Mm. But over the nearly 40 years, that change has happened very, very slowly. 
Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that all new buildings yeah. today um, in the UK have to have to be accessible for everyone. I mean, for example, I built my own house about 10 years ago and by law I had to have my front door wide enough to accommodate wheelchair access, whether someone was going to use it or not, it didn't matter. You have to, you have, to have it, which I think is really good. It's a great move forward. And I think um, it's not really just about the buildings anymore. It's now about attitudes. We move so far forward towards um, integrating racial casting and we've moved forward on that whole political point of view of seeing beyond what you see as far as colour is concerned now we need to get there as regard to disability yeah you're absolutely right now there's a second excerpt which you'd like to share with us today please can you tell us about what we're going to hear this one is taken from a recording of a christmas carol um, by charles dickens which i recorded in 2021 in November and I'm very lucky to say that this was an audio version but later in this later this year at the end of November I'll be performing the whole piece live in a in a production of A Christmas Carol at the Actors Church in Covent Garden. Oh fantastic. I see what is before me. I understand what you are trying to tell me. That this man could very well be me if I do not change. I know what I must do. Surely, I am not too late. Oh, please, Spirit, show me some kindness and tenderness and do not condemn me to death. Or this man's death, and do not leave me in this dark chamber where I will be forever. If there is one person who will show some emotion after this man's death, then please take me to him. I beseech you, O oh Spirit, he was just a child, a poor little child. He did not deserve to die. Well, Mark, only... that was absolutely brilliant. Now, A Christmas Carol, I think, is an absolute classic, and I've seen so many film versions. But did you say you're doing a staged version? I am, yes. I, I, it will be on from, I think it's the 20th of November to the 26th of November. Oh my gosh, so that is going to be so much fun. How many performances will that be? I think there's going to be about eight altogether, eight or nine, depending right, okay. on the, the amount of uh, matinees that we're going to do. And it will be on at the Actors Church in Covent Garden oh. in cent central London, known as St Martin's. Oh, I know, I've sung there. I've sung there. I know it's an Actors Church, but I've actually sung there. <laughs> it's got a be I beautiful uh, um, sound to it yeah yeah it has it really has now I should think there are probably a lot of budding actors out there that would dream of playing that part so can I ask what advice would you give to aspiring and existing actors with disabilities that's a very big question <laughs> uh, um I I think luckily I think there are opportunities and courses and drama schools and all the normal routes now that actors are encouraged to take are open to people with disabilities. And I know people from RADA have been there. Uh, pe sorry, people with disabilities are now accepted at RADA and uh, people with hard of, you know, hard of hearing or deafness are, are also taken on to various courses. I know, so that's a great start. But personally, I think the best advice I was given was from the director of a drama school when I was 17, who basically said to me, sorry, at 16, who basically said to me, Mark, you're good enough to work, go and work now. And I believe that I wouldn't have been as successful if I hadn't have just taken the, taken the bullet and just gone with it really. Yes, I was very lucky, but I also worked incredibly hard and that's why it's continued today. 
Oh, I think that's absolutely amazing. I really do. You've done so well, honestly. Now, I know that our listeners would really love to hear about what you're working on today and the projects you have planned for the future. I know you mentioned that you're going to be doing the Christmas Carol, but do you have anything else in the pipeline? At the moment, I'm in talks with um, a company in the Cotswolds to do a version of the importance of being earnest later in the summer. In the summer. Um, and I will be taking on the role of Lady Bracknell, which will be an absolute joy because the last person to play that role in England is David Suchet wow. in, a West, in a West End production. So, but it's very early days and we're just in discussions about it. Okay, so what happens then? Do you, do you just get the scripts and then start to learn your part? How long do you have to learn a part? It depends on how long the rehearsal process is. And on average, uh, the rehearsal process would probably start, uh, would be no more than three, three to four weeks, possibly. And that's a long time. Right. OK, so is that part very big? Is there a lot to learn? <laughs> yes, yes. She's in every act um, oh. and she's very funny. It's a very funny part to play. That's fantastic. So when would that be, sorry? I think it will be later in the summer once it's all been confirmed. Okay, so at the moment, are you reading through it to get to get used to the character and no, Not yet, not yet, until I know it's definitely going to happen. As soon as I know it's going to happen, then I'll go into work mode and Right. And, start and, and, the, and the Christmas Carol, is, is that going to be a staged version? It is. It is going to be a staged version with a cast of about nine people, I think. And we're going to have... Um, classical singers as well that will sing in between scenes. Oh, that sounds really different. So it's going to be, it is, it's going to be very magical, I think. And it's, the script is very much aimed at children. And I know the director and I are working towards together at, at advertising it very much for local children around London and central London to come and see. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. Oh, Mark, I just really want to say thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your inspiring journey with our listeners. We wish you continued success with your ongoing and future projects. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a joy. Able Voices is a production of the Berkeley Institute for Arts, Education and Special Needs, led by me, Dr. Rhoda Bernard, the founding managing director. It is produced by Daniel Martinez Del Campo. The introduction music is by Kai Levin, and our closing song is by Sebastian Batista. Kai and Sebastian are students in the arts education programs at the Berkeley Institute for Arts, Education and Special Needs. If you would like to learn more about our work, you can find us online at berkeley.edu slash B-I-A-E-S-N or email us at B-I-A-E-S-N at berkeley, that's L-E-E dot E-D-U.